understanding Sharia. Because the Sharia is said to be that according to which the life of the Ummah should be regulated. And which groups such as the Takfiri Jihadists or Boko Haram claim to be applying. Now the sources of Sharia are fourfold. There is first the Quran, considered by Muslims to be divine revelation. And there are a certain number of legislative texts in the Quran, but these texts do not give full precision on different matters that have to be decided. A simple example is the question of salat, of prayer. One could say that there is an obligation in the Quran to pray, yes, but how many times a day? That is not indicated in the Quran. It has to come from somewhere else. So the Quran needs to be supplemented by as something else as a source of legislation. And this is provided by the Sunnah, the tradition of the Prophet. The, the Prophet Muhammad is presented by the Quran as a model for believers. So what the Prophet said, what the Prophet did, what the Prophet did not say, what the Prophet did not do becomes the norm for Muslims generally. And this is based on reports, on hadith, which go back to companions of the Prophet and sometimes to his wives, for example to Aisha. Questions can arise about the reliability of these reports, these hadith. Are they authentic? Or have they been fabricated? And so within Islam a whole science has developed with regard to the hadith, separating the sound from the unsound, the strongly attested from the weak. And though there are collections of sound hadith, even these are subject to scrutiny. A further difficulty arises, of course, when the essential point of a hadith, the point of law which it is considered to present, is transferred from its 7th century context to the present day. Can the responsibility of the owner of a rampaging camel for damages that this camel has brought about be applied to motor insurance? <laughs> Well, this brings us to a third source of the Sharia, Qiyas, which is analogy. And this implies a rational appreciation which can differ from one person to another. And this gives rise to a variety of opinions. An opinion, a fatwa, is an application of the law to a particular situation. But who gives this fatwa? Who can make such a pronouncement? When self-proclaimed scholars, and very often on the internet, are publishing pronouncements on all kinds of questions, a sort of legal chaos can be created. So in Muslim-majority countries, there is usually a designated mufti who is to give an answer to uh, an official opinion on various questions. And in Egypt, the mufti has a, a whole ensemble, a whole staff with him in the Dar al-Ifta to answer the multiplicity of requests for pronouncements on every kind of subject. They told me that they have thousands of requests by email, by telephone, every day. Uh, people are wanting to know, what, what, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? Now, when legal opinions are brought into harmony, we have reached the fourth and final source of Sharia called Ijma, consensus. As the consensus of the whole Islamic sum, uh, Ummah would be difficult to ascertain, it is thought sufficient that there should be a consensus of the leading scholars of the time. Now, scholars, as we know, can come to an agreement with difficulty, but they can also agree to differ. And so, in Islam, there are four legal schools. 
which are recognized, the Maliki, the Hanafi, the Shafi, and the Hanbali. These have developed and they're all recognized as having authority within the Islamic legal system. And to those could be added the Jafari school, which is that of the Ithna Ashri Shia. And this legal variety itself could be considered as a fulfillment of a prophetic hadith, fil ikhtilaf rahma. In difference, there is mercy. So when it is proclaimed that Sharia law is going to be applied, the question will arise as to which Sharia? Who is going to decide which type of Sharia is to be applied? And who is to control its application, seeing that all the conditions are to be fulfilled before a judgment is given? Yes, it is stated in the Qur'an, cut off the hands of thieves, whether they are man or woman, as punishment for what they have done. Yes, that is said. But strict conditions are laid down for the application of this had punishment. The swift application of the punishment of cutting off of hands practiced in some countries is surely not in accordance with the provisions of the Sharia properly understood. So we can safely conclude, at least in my opinion, that the takfiri jihadists who have proclaimed an Islamic state or who have declared their allegiance to the Islamic State, where Sharia law will be observed, under the guidance of a self-designated caliph, are not upholding Islamic tradition, whatever they may say. Can there be dialogue with such people? I fear not. For these people are convinced that they hold the truth, and therefore they do not need to listen to other people. They won't listen to fellow Muslims, many of whom they consider not to be true Muslims, and even less will they speak to non-Muslims except to invite them to embrace Islam. Does this mean that there can be no dialogue with Muslims? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I mean that it absolutely does not mean that there can be no dialogue with Muslims. The takfiri jihadists do not represent true Muslims. And it shouldn't be supposed that the majority of Muslims are in agreement with them. Muslim authorities in different parts of the world have condemned the horrible acts of violence that have been perpetrated. Unfortunately, very often these declarations are ignored by the Western press, which is always calling for Muslims to speak out. In fact, I think ordinary Muslims are wearied of having to declare their distance from the takfiri jihadists, as if all Muslims were potential terrorists. 